Hey, we are in this series called Asking for a Friend. We are answering 100% of the questions that all of you and some of your peers submitted to Nick and the youth ministry. And all of these questions were too good that we couldn't leave off any of them. We were going to just end this series tonight, but we instead decided to expand it. Nick wanted to cover all the topics, so we're going through all of June. There's three in June? Yeah, three in June. because we're, There's five Sundays in June, but we're taking off. Father's, Father's Day, Day, and then the Sunday after the summer trip. Right. So, I think there were now up to 35 questions. Yeah, 35. 35 questions. We're doing about seven a week. And so, we kind of, we try to pair them up in subjects. Just a heads up, Nick already sent an email to all of your parents, and in his email this week, we'll send it another reminder. Not next week, but the week after, June 3rd, is our sensitive topic night, June 2nd. June 2nd is our sensitive topic night. So all of the questions that we deemed more sensitive, there's a few on sexuality, uh, there's a, I don't even remember the other ones. Those are the biggest ones. The other ones are less sensitive, just more tough to answer, or harder questions to answer, like, uh, does God listen to us without judgment? Or why does God call us in uncomfortable places and things like that? So, there's a... so we're glad you all. We're glad you all are asking questions, especially about sexuality. You know that is a very common um, topic in your schools and on social media right now. And there's no better place to address that than the church. And so we are excited to talk about that. But just keep a heads up. Um, in two weeks, if you're inviting friends, maybe give them a warning. Like we're talking about. Uh, some more sensitive topics, but tonight we have seven questions, seven or eight questions, and they are all under the theme of God in the Bible, okay? So I'll pray for us, and then we'll dive in. God, thank you so much for all of these teams who ask really good questions, bold questions, honest and vulnerable questions. God, we just pray that you would honor our discussion, help give us wisdom as we answer, and hearts to discern and receive. In your name I pray, amen. All right, so question number one, and tonight, most uh, all of the questions that, like Jordan said, we try to group them into kind of <coughs> themes, category type things, and all of these questions are ones that were more like questions that needed biblical support of like, I don't understand this thing in the Bible, or like, what does the Bible say about this or was this really in the Bible? Things like that. So keep that in mind as we go. So tonight, the very first question is, um, does God want me to be happy? And this is a question that especially those who have experienced suffering, loss, or mental illness like anxiety or depression or thoughts of suicide, or you've experienced broken homes, trauma, uh, abuse, you probably ask this question. Does God truly want me to be happy? Because how I'm feeling often is the opposite of that. And so here's my response. It's a quick and absolute yes. God does want you to experience both happiness and joy. Those are two very important words that we have to understand the difference in. Okay, Happiness is an emotion. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is not determined by our current situation. And so that's why people who experience suffering say, I still experience the joy of God. Because their situation does not determine how they're feeling. Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit that all Christ followers experience when they are in Christ. Happiness, on the other hand, is an emotion. That is something completely determined by your environments, by your experiences, your personality, your peers, etc. Okay? Happiness is what goes up and down. As Christ followers, we are called to experience complete joy. God wants you to experience both. Joy is under our control of prayer, leaning on God. The more time you spend with God, the more joy we will experience. So if you want to experience joy, 
then you are called to spend more time with God. Because as you spend time with God, the fruit of the Spirit grows inside you. Happiness is more times than not out of our control, situation-wise, but we can choose how to respond, okay? And so here's what I put on the screen. God doesn't want you to experience happiness at the expense of holiness, right? And that's very important for us to keep in mind. Is it actually up there? Oh, good. God doesn't want to experience happiness at the expense of holiness. And to make sure we're not talking about this for three hours, because Nick also has an answer, uh, in other terms, God's not going to give you permission to sin or to live in an impure way in order to experience things that make you happy. So God won't give you permission to do drugs, alcohol, watch pornography, uh, have sex with your girlfriend. Just because it's something that makes you happy and God wants you to be happy, he's not going to allow you to do things that provide happiness at the expense of fullness, okay? So yes, God wants you to be happy, but he wants you to achieve happiness living the right way. Yeah, so in, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 32, chap, uh, chapter 32, verse 11, it says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And so... This psalm, it's, what it tells us here is that, it, what it's showing us is that being joyful, being happy, isn't just something that we are allowed to do, but it's something that we're commanded to do. It says, be glad in the Lord. Like, it doesn't say, like, if you feel like it, like, it's saying, find joy in the Lord. Um, it's a command that we are called to carry out. Uh, but if you, look at the, if you look at the verses there, it says, be glad, but then next to that it says, In the Lord, be righteous, shout for joy, you upright in heart. That kind of echoes the sentiment that Jordan said of our joy and our righteousness or our joy and our um, being upright in heart or our joy and being in the Lord. Like Those have to go hand in hand. We can't have one without the other. Um, we're called to be filled with joy, not just so that we can be happy um, or just at random. We're called to be filled with joy because of the relationship we have with Jesus. So second question then. Um, this is less about what is in the Bible and more on how you get what's in the Bible. The question is, what are ways to help give us drive to read the Bible and pray more? So what are ways to motivate us to read the Bible? And my biggest motivation for spending time with God is that the person I am after I spend time with God is so much more enjoyable to be around and to be than the person I am when I don't spend time with God. That's really the biggest motivation we should have is that we are more kind, more patient, filled with more self-control, Filled with more joy, more love, uh, more truth, more grace, more compassion when we spend time with God. And I noticed that in my own prayer life. And so if you are just trying to like will yourself to do things, you're not going to be able to lose weight that way. Uh, you're not going to be able to uh, just become disciplined in faith just by saying, you know what, I'm just going to do it. You're going to have to find ways that you connect with God that encourage you to want to do those things. But the biggest thing for me is that the person I am after I spend time with God is so much more enjoyable to be around and to be. I'm a better father, better husband, and a better pastor when I spend time with God in prayer and reading scripture. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to the question that we just answered of finding joy through our relationship with Jesus and, and that we experience happiness through holiness that when we come out of, uh, like when you spend time with God, that's where you find your happiness. Like, there's motivation in that. I want to feel happy, I want to feel joyful, so that's gonna send you to being with God. Um, another thing that I've used as an example before um, is this idea of shepherds, um, especially like uh, back in biblical times, like what shepherds would do, like their whole job was to take care of sheep, watch over this flock of sheep. 
And every night, when they were bringing their sheep into shelter for the night, they would have them go in one at a time, and they would place their hand on each sheep and call it by name or talk to it. And this is because sheep are pretty dumb. And so they need a lot of repetition. And by nightly hearing the shepherd's voice and feeling his touch, they became familiar with him and understood that he was their caregiver, he was their master, he was the one that was in charge of them. In the same way, when we spend consistent time in God's word, we begin to familiarize ourselves with his voice and with the, who he is and with um, his presence, which then be, causes us to be able to recognize it when he's speaking to us. That when we're consistently hearing his voice, when we're consistently making time for that, and we learn to recognize his voice, then in those moments where God is reaching out to tell us something and, and is trying to play something on our hearts, we can say, oh, I recognize that voice. I know that this is God. This is something that he is calling me to. Um, and so in the same way, he wants to place his hand on you and talk to you regularly so that you learn to hear from him. Uh, third question. Does the Bible ever say that the snake in Genesis was Satan? Uh, this is an easy answer. No. The Bible does not explicitly say that the snake in Genesis chapter 3, or 2 and 3, is Satan. The snake, however, is representing uh, rather than representing Satan as a person, it just represents sin. And so whether or not the snake was literally Satan or not is not foundational to your faith. That's why the Bible doesn't claim it. It's more so just representative of temptation, of sin, of the thing that is trying to pull us away from God's will. Question number four, unless you want to add a line to that. Okay. Question number four, when starting to read the Bible, oh, this is a great question. When starting to read the Bible, where is a good place to begin? And I'll just share my personal thoughts. Uh, I love to have people start in the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Luke. I personally like Luke a little bit better because it is more informational. John is more applicational. Is that a word? Yeah. John is more about application. Luke is more about information. John is also very, like, spiritual. John is very spiritual, touchy-feely, and, and uh, it's more about the signs of Jesus. Why I also love starting Luke is because it goes right into Acts, which is the life of the church. It's like two days separated from Luke into Acts. But the reason I start with Jesus is because when we are first believing in God, the foundation to our faith is the resurrection of Jesus. That is the foundation of our faith. And so until we build our foundation on Jesus who lived, died, and resurrected, then the rest of the Bible won't make sense. Because Old Testament and New Testament all point to Jesus. And when you know who Jesus is, who he was, lived, died, and rose, then you'll be able to see Jesus all throughout scriptures. All throughout Genesis, Exodus, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, you'll see Jesus show up. And so whenever someone asks me, where do I start? I send them to John or Luke. Uh, and then after that, Galatians, and then a couple of the other letters. And then I like to send them to Genesis uh, to hear about our origin story. Nick? Yeah, I, I agree with... Uh... A lot of what I wrote here is, is the same thing. Uh, I agree, God, the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Luke, are, they both tell the same story but give different representations of it. Like we said, John is more, there are some of the parables and some of the um, stories of Jesus are only in John's Gospel and aren't in the other three. Um, and so there's some parts of it that like, you get uh, just a little bit more of the character of Jesus through John, but Luke um, Luke was a physician, he was a doctor, he was very smart, and so he goes to a lot more length to make sure he accurately recorded, like, this is the story, 
and you get more of the facts. And I like Luke because then, like Jordan said, it goes into Acts. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. And so it's one author that continues this story basically from the birth of Jesus through the birth of the church and, and everything. And so I like to start there because then you get the foundation of what we stand for, the character and life of Jesus into the beginning of this church that we are a part of, and then you can read the rest that fills in uh, our history or application of this life that we call Christianity. Um, I also really like the book of Romans. Uh, I think it navigates a lot of the tough things about being a Christian. I mean, that's why we used it as kind of the, the foundation for that building blocks series of like what it means to live a Christian life uh, because there's so many pieces of it in Romans of how to live, how salvation, where we get salvation from, about how to share the gospel, all those kind of things. So uh, either the gospels, John or Luke, uh, into Acts or then into Romans. I, I like that too. All right, question number five. Jordan kind of started this conversation this morning. Um, what is hell like? Yeah, I just, I caught on this this morning. So hashtag ad, go on to YouTube and watch the whole sermon if you want a more in-depth message where I break down all of how, yeah, you got the answer? I remember. All right, Coop, what is it? You did your best. Gehenna. Yeah, I wasn't going to dive into all of that for this answer. I love it, though. Um, hell, yeah, Chris, what you got? Okay, so that was what the Old Testament believed. Who shared what the New Testament believed, which was a burning site for babies? Yeah, no. It's a place separated, like completely separated off and cut off from God. There we go. So what we shared is what I, I shared all of the different things that Christians grew up believing. Uh, you can watch the message online. But at Crossbridge, we believe that hell is a literal place that is completely separated from God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Old Testament believed that hell was more of a mystical, ghost-like place. New Testament, the word hell is Gehenna, which is what Coop was saying. That was a literal place in Jerusalem where they used to sacrifice babies to their gods. And so when Jesus talked about hell, he referenced Gehenna, this literal place. And so we believe that hell is a place for people who do not choose God's grace but choose separation from God, and it will be completely separated from God. No Holy Spirit, no Jesus, no fruit of the Spirit, so there will be no love, no joy, no peace. And that sounds like a place of hell all in and of itself. Yeah, I think uh, when people think of hell and they think of like, oh, there's this place where there's all this torture and pain and misery and think of burning forever in fire and all that stuff. Um, but the real, like, punishment or torture of hell isn't burning in fire, but eternally knowing. Because, like, what, what Jordan talked about this morning, of this like, concept of eternity. People think of, like, John 3.16 of, like, whoever believes in Jesus receives eternal life. But, like, eternity is true for all of us. It's just what side of eternity you're on. Uh, and if you refuse to accept the grace that Christ offers and, uh, and reject that salvation, then what the torture, ultimately the punishment ends up being is this eternally knowing that you turned your back on salvation and made the wrong choice. Like there are people who actively say, no, I don't believe in God. I'm not going to be a Christian. Like, that's not, that's fake, whatever, like, I'm an atheist, and then what ends up, like, the eternal punishment is getting to the other side and saying, oh, I was wrong, like, I had the opportunity to accept Jesus, I had the opportunity, I, this was in front of me, and I rejected it, and now you spend eternity knowing that you're on the outside looking in. Um, question number six, um, Throughout the Bible, we see this word uh, that comes up occasionally, which is Zion. So the question is, what is Zion? 
Yeah, reference all throughout Zion was another literal place and a, a monumental place for Jerusalem. It was a hill or mountain in Jerusalem. But then the Bible also used Zion to reference the holy city of Jerusalem itself and the holiness of God and the goodness of God and the kingdom of God. And so whenever you see the Bible talk about Mount Zion or Zion as a whole, um, it's referencing a, little, a literal place, but it's also referencing a metaphorical place of like, this is God's glory. This is God's highness. This is God's royalty. This is God's kingdom, um, etc. Yeah, it, it, the meaning of Zion kind of grows throughout the Bible. Like when it's first, the first mention of it is in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7, talking about uh, King David as he's gone and like conquered and captured places. It says, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. So this is the first mention. This is the actual place uh, of Zion. And then when King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, the meaning of Zion expanded to include the temple area. And it, like Jordan said, it kind of is just wherever God dwells is God's dwelling place, which then means that as the New Testament has gone on, um, like in Jordan's message this morning, he talked about how we be, have become the tabernacle. Each of us, as the body of Christ, we have become the the church. And so, the word Zion is used in a theological or spiritual sense to mean God's spiritual kingdom, wherever God's people dwell. Now, Peter in First um, Peter, he's quoting a reference to it in. Isaiah refers to Jesus as the cornerstone of Zion, like wherever Jesus is, that's where Zion is. He says in 1 Peter, uh, I think it's what, 2 Yeah. Uh, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Um, so this was written originally in the Old Testament in Isaiah, but Peter is refer references this um, and shows how it points to Jesus. That he says, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Um, and shows how this Jesus is this cornerstone of God's kingdom. And so what he's saying is that wherever his kingdom is, which is wherever we are as his people, like that's what Zion is, is where God's people are, where God dwells, which is within us. All right, question number seven. Last one for the night. Would Jesus have gone through the crucifixion and resurrection even if I or you were the only one who needed saving? I think so. I believe so. And the reason being is because we see this language from Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus shares three parables, which are stories, with the Pharisees about one thing or person or sheep. The three stories he shares are the first one about a lost sheep, where the sheep leaves the 99 and goes off and wanders, and Jesus calls the people to go chase after that one sheep. Even though there are 99 righteous people, there was one who was missing, and it broke Jesus for it. So he, he called him to chase after that. And then the second story is about the lost coin. He talks about a, a woman who searches her house frantically for that one lost coin. And then the third story is about the one lost son. Actually, it's about two lost sons. If you want to hear about that, you can buy my fourth book coming out in 2026. Hashtag ad. But why so long? Why so long? Because some idiot decided to get his masters. <laughs> uh, but it's about a lost son who leaves and how he comes home and, and the father welcomes him with open arms. So, yeah, I think that Jesus would still die even if it was just to save me or you or one person. We see that language from Jesus all the time, but it, it is kind of weird to think about. Hopefully the rest of the world would murder Jesus for one person. But we probably would. <laughs> we probably would. It is unfair. It is true. Yeah, the parable of the lost sheep. Remember what I said about sheep? They're dumb. Um, sometimes they wander out. That's why we have shepherds. Um, but yeah, it says that the shepherd would leave the 99 safe sheep to track down the one lost one. 
Um, and we, you probably have all screamed the words to one of your favorite worship songs, Reckless Love, that references this, par- this parable where it says, the overwhelming, never-ending. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, soprano. Oh, it chases me. Got a bear choke. I just had to make sure everyone was locked in. I'm pretty sure the mic just exploded. <laughs> but... Yeah, it says, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And it's referencing this parable of leaving the 99 sheep to find the one lost one. And we are the lost one. Um, and there are people who have had trouble with that, that song when it came out, the wording. And I absolutely love it to call God reckless. Because it seems crazy that Jesus would do all of that for one person, and that's what makes his love reckless and amazing, is that he would, he would do that. He would, in the same way that God bankrupted heaven and sent Jesus down for us, I mean, even all of humanity is as worthless as one of us would compare to Jesus. Like, Jesus is above everything. So, one of us compared to billions of us like, it's still just a drop in the bucket compared to who Jesus is. Um, and yet he would, so for him, it's his creation. It's his, the, the ones that he loves. And he is, will make that, would make that choice to, to die for just one of us. Uh, because that's who he is. That's all, that tests. There we go. That's all the questions. So we're going to pray. And then for your small group time, um, feel free to process any of those questions or share some questions with your small group leaders that sparked from tonight. Let's pray. Hey, God, thank you so much for the space. Thank you for the questions that were asked. I just pray, God, that you bless our time with our small group leaders and give us the courage to ask bold questions. And we pray. Amen. All right, go to your small groups.